So hello, uh, welcome everyone to the IIT Bay Area's first uh, breaking into CXO um, series uh, uh, meetup. Um, as most of you may know, IITBayArea.org um, is a nonprofit entity in California, and uh, it caters to the 15,000 or so IITNs in the Bay Area from all the IITs, uh, not just the old five or six, uh, but all the new ones as well, uh, and their families. Uh, the goal is to uh, organize events and programs so uh, the alumni base can enjoy uh, and learn and grow in their professional careers and personal lives. So what programs do we have? Right. Uh, there are essentially two types of programs. The first two buckets here are all part of the same conference. Um, uh, so traditionally when it was formed, it was part of the pan IIT and gradually we realized that California has enough critical mass and pan IIT was not a nonprofit. So we incorporate ourselves as a nonprofit entity that gave us a lot of advantages in fundraising, et cetera. And, um, uh, for most of the time, we organized uh, one big conference every year and maybe a few events here and there. Uh, but last year, we added Campus Mixer to the leadership conference during lunchtime. It was a huge success. Um, Campus Mixer is essentially a space for each IIT to gather and do whatever they want. Uh, some of the younger IITs uh, are not as well formed, so this... Uh, space is, is really important for them to just uh, gather and do their things. Uh, what got added a couple of years ago is also clubs. Uh, this is uh, started two years ago with uh, a book club and a health club, eventually also career club and hiking club. So all, uh, these four clubs are four, uh, two to two and a half year old. Uh, and over the time, now we have uh, many clubs. So before we go to the clubs, uh, let me remind everyone that the big conference for this year, the leadership conference is happening on 16th September. Tickets are um, about $150 right now. Um, so as you wait longer, the ticket price will only increase. So book your tickets now. You can go to iitbayarea.org and book your tickets. Um, as you can see, uh, we have Jensen as uh, our keynote speaker, and there are a lot of exciting panels. Um, coming back to the clubs, um, as you can see, uh, the book club, career series, uh, and uh, health and hiking are the first four clubs, and then we added a lot of these new clubs. So now we have uh, about 20, 25 clubs. Um, some are uh, very active, as active as uh, uh, happening, every, events happening every day. The Racket Club meets every day in Milpitas and Sunnyvale. Uh, but most of the other clubs are, have monthly events. Uh, hiking has been going on for almost two and a half years, nonstop, rain or shine. Um, book club has been also going on very consistently every month. Music Club started uh, last year and it's a huge success. We are almost at one year anniversary of the Music Club. And then other clubs are, uh, you know, also doing very well. Uh, we just started the Travel Club, Climate Tech Club, Youth Parenting, um, and uh, the CXO. Uh, so this is uh, first event for the CXO Club. And I will uh, let Jeet then talk about the CXO club because it was uh, his brain uh, child and uh, he came up with the idea and uh, we worked on it. And uh, I'll let Jeet speak more about it. Thank you, thank you, Rishi. And uh, hey everyone, thanks for joining in. And first of all, my sincere thanks to Harsha uh, for accepting our invitation to be a first CEO, CEO on our CXO series for ITN. So, Harsha, thank you. Really appreciate oh, my pleasure. Uh, your being here. Uh, my name is Jitendra. I 
I have almost 20 years of work, leadership work experience across companies like Accenture and Google. And currently, I lead the partnership and strategic alliances for Google. And over my career, I have seen that uh, there was very limited material available for breaking into CXOs. There are a lot of people uh, reached out to me. I reached out to many people. So it always, the knowledge is always through the connections and the people you know. I worked with some of the amazing CEOs and CXOs in my uh, in my career and uh, was trying to understand the pattern, right? What makes somebody successful? What other people can learn? And I always thought that there's very limited practical information around it. And the best way to learn is from someone who's been there and done that. So that's the reason uh, Rishi and I thought, you know, we should start this series. Uh, because one, there is a large interest. And number two, there are amazing CEOs like Harsha who can come and share their journey. And number three is, uh, I'm sure all of you are here on Monday evening to learn about uh, about the CEO or CXO journey. That shows that you are a C CXO asper aspirants and you can put together, you can learn as much as from this and potentially implement in your career journey. So we want to be uh, make it useful, helpful to everyone. In fact, if you have any suggestions uh, for future sessions, feel free to let us know. We plan to do this on a monthly basis. We'll have a uh, we'll have a CEO on a monthly basis sharing their journey, and you will have an opportunity to learn what has worked uh, practically and potentially incorporated in your journey as well. So that's it from my side. Uh, really excited for this session, and uh, Rishi and Harsha, thank you. And Rishi, over to you with this. Okay. So uh, let me uh, briefly introduce um, Harsha. Uh, most of you probably read his um, profile uh, either on the post or on the product uh, website. So I will not go too deep into it. Um, as we all know, he's CEO of uh, product. Uh, he leads the strategy, oversees business operations and all the stuff that a CEO does. Um, uh, of course, we're very proud that he is our own IIT alumni. Uh, he did his bachelor in technology from IIT Delhi. Uh, then he came to US for his master's in computer science at UMCP, uh, like most of us have done. And uh, he has a, a long work history, but I just wanted to highlight a few roles, uh, leadership roles. Uh, he was a lead architect at, uh, at uh, GE, and that's, I believe, a technical role. And uh, then uh, he was CTO at EC Cubed and EVP at uh, what USA before he joined Product. Um, now, some of his uh, jobs, he climbed the career ladder. And uh, I, I see a lot of panels focused on uh, the technology and some of those aspects, but I'm going to completely push that aside here. Uh, I want to focus on you, Harsha. Uh, you know, your journey, your decision making. Uh, we want to get inside your thinking process uh, and understand what does it really take to become a CEO? So um, with that, I will stop this uh, share and uh, we'll switch to the review mode. Um, I also wanted to talk briefly about my journey. Um, uh, just like Harsha, I came to the US for masters after IIT. I uh, was in engineering role for a long time. Um, I you know, did uh, climb the career ladder there, but uh, you know, definitely not as fast. I decided to get an MBA because um, I was stuck in engineering problems. And then I realized uh, you actually have to solve business problems and uh, engineering uh, or technical stuff is just a way to solve it. Um, so since then I uh, had a number of customer facing roles where I did that translation between the customer business problems to technical solutions. Uh, but that is just a skill. Um, that's not what it takes to become a CXO. Uh, you have to understand the organization, many more things. Clearly, um, I am also stuck in, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
not able to cross that chasm. And this was also my very personal interest. So with that, um, let's jump into the questions. So Harsha, um, for everyone's sake, uh, although I did a, a very brief summary of your career, I would like to hear it in your own words. Uh, please uh, talk sure. about your career journey. And what I would like to focus is uh, three, uh, three uh, different inflection points in your career journey and uh, you know what data you had and what decisions you had to make and uh, how it really impacted your journey towards this VX role. Sure. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. And Jitu, thanks for putting me in touch with Rishikesh. And it's really nice to meet you all. Um, it has been an interesting journey and uh, it is still uh, being written. So uh, it is it is not over yet and uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it. So very briefly, I uh, grew up in different parts of India because my father was in the armed forces. I think similar background, Jitu, to your father, right? If I, if I remember right. Um, so he was in the Air Force, so we kind of moved around quite a bit. But eventually we spent most of our time in Delhi and uh, I studied in uh, Delhi school. Uh, luckily, uh, went to IIT Delhi, so it was kind of convenient. And uh, then came for the master's uh, to the US and uh, then got a job and then, you know, started a company and so on and so forth. Uh, eventually ended up having some long stints at a few companies, very long stint, 15 years at, at a company called Virtusa. Uh, which was a services company, is a services company. And we made it a billion dollar company and went public in 2007. And then for the last seven or eight years, I've been with ProDap and similar kind of growth uh, stage company that I've now got the, uh, the opportunity to lead. Um, but there are a lot of interesting things along the way, which, you know, I'd like to call out. And um, uh, Hrishikesh, you know, feel free to kind of compartmentalize this into questions so it doesn't become a big ramble. But maybe I'll take two or three minutes and then I'll pause and then we'll deep dive into any uh, section you want. Okay. Um, because it's about climbing CXO, I was giving some thought to, you know, what led me uh, up the leadership track. And the first thing I would say is that, you know, a lot of it has to come from self-drive. And I was thinking back about when I first assumed a leadership position. It was before I started working, right? It was at IIT. So um, I'm sure every IIT you went to would have the equivalent of a BSA, which in IIT Delhi is Board for Sports Activities. So I was a very good uh, table tennis player. I played uh, table tennis at the state level. And so I ended up becoming the captain of the IIT Delhi table tennis team. And in the fourth year, I became the general secretary, GSEC for sports. Uh, I actually led the contingent to IIT Kharagpur. I believe, Jitu, you went to IIT Kharagpur. So uh, I led the contingent long back. I'm dating myself now. I, I, I sound very old when I say I was there in December of 1991, uh, leading the IIT Delhi contingent in Kharagpur. Why I bring this up uh, is because in addition to inter-IIT, we scheduled and pulled off one of the largest sports events in um, history at that point called Sportech. It was called Sportech 91. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a lot of work to kind of uh, raise money, get colleges to participate and all that. After I won the election and I was very happy and all jubilant, in a couple of days it dawned upon me that I had pretty much no team not much of a budget and no power. And that was my biggest uh, learning at that young age of 20 or whatever I was. So I, I then had to, you know, band together a bunch of really friends, hostel mates, wing mates, as you would remember. And a lot of the work I got done, which was a tremendous amount of work was because of friendship and relationships and influence not power. And I think that was one of the key, key learnings for me very early before I started my professional career. 
The other thing I want to just highlight is, uh, you know, persistence. I'm very proud of this. So I actually did not want to leave Delhi because I'm a Delhiite. I literally lived across the street from IIT Delhi, you know, Sarvodhi Enclave. And so with my rank, I, I was not going to get computer science unless, you know, I went to ITBHU and, and I didn't want to go to ITBHU or, you know, whatever. So I got textile technology, which was not <laughs> what, what I was interested in. I wanted to be in software programming, but I wanted to be in Delhi. So I stayed in uh, Delhi, uh, did a little bit of programming courses, but somehow, you know, as we used to say, fight market, right? I, I managed to get uh, into master's in uh, uh, systems engineering, computer systems engineering in Maryland. And obviously with no computer science degree, I was not going to get a scholarship. So it was hard. I mean, when I landed up for doing my master's competing with others who had a bachelor's in computer science without a scholarship. So I was working multiple jobs, you know, teaching mathematics to the women's basketball team in Maryland, shelving books. I was literally putting books away in the library for, I don't know those days what it was, $8 an hour or whatever it was, $9 an hour. So it was pretty hard. And uh, that's how my journey started. But then, you know, I, I did figure it out. I did learn as much programming as I needed. I did get a 4.0 GPA despite not having a bachelor's in, in computers and so on and so forth. So those are just why I bring up that point is just to talk about persistence. I mean, I tell my son often and my daughter that success is not like a straight line. It is not the picture perfect path that you would imagine. In fact, my path is anything but perfect. But it is a story of a lot of persistence and not giving up. And I can keep going on and on, but let me just pause there, uh, Rishikesh, and uh, see if you want me to keep going or if you have specific questions and we can make it more interactive. Right. I mean, please uh, continue on. Uh, you know, there's definitely a learning here. You chose to, uh, you know, be uh, leading that sports tech team. Uh, and, you know, you still chose to come to the U.S. with a computer science and get a computer science uh, scholarship or, or degree rather. And then yeah. Jugard Marke, you kind of figured out a way to, uh, you know, make money still. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, what it tells me is the leadership was there right in the beginning. Um, you know, you just jump into it and then you figure out uh, how to exit, you know, how to get the pieces together um, like for the sports tech you became a leader and then you figured out how to enroll your um, uh, fellow uh, wingmates or others uh, inspire them to kind of leave their studies I guess <laughs> and, and help with uh, yes the sports. absolutely and 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 you know why this is relevant is because very often we are seeking power when we say we want to become an, a CXO or whatever, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think, you know, I, I respect people who want power as long as it is power to create an impact. Um, you know, when people want power just for the sake of own growth, I think that tends to be short-lived and that ends up in politics and all that. But as long as you want power to be able to make the calls and get the organization going in the right direction, I think it's all it's all good. Um, so, I mean, I, these are the examples we can easily relate to because all of us have gone through IIT experience. But uh, tell about a similar example in your professional career where you know you just maybe took up a huge responsibility and, and uh, uh, yeah, what was going on in your mind? Uh, uh, I mean, did you know that you can build a team or how? That's very interesting. So for me, you know, again, it may not be the path that many of you choose, but I would imagine, uh, and there's also a question on the chat, I think, uh, uh, about how, you know, I got into leadership and all that. So it's interesting because you're in the Bay Area, I'm hoping that some of you are entrepreneurs. So my path to leadership was not the classical, you know, become a, uh, engineer, then a team lead, then a project manager or an architect, then become a director, then become a senior director, then become an AVP, then become a VP. It was not that. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, if I had gone down that path or up that path, I may never have made it to CEO, to be honest. 
Now, I'm not suggesting all of you quit your uh, large company jobs and run out the door and start a company. Uh, because if you're meant to do it, you'll know that you're meant to do it. And it is very difficult and it is full of risk. Uh, luckily, um, let me rewind a little bit. So I came for my master's. I finished my master's. I went to work for Bell Core, Bell Communications Research, doing hardcore telecom programming. And I want to give a story about entrepreneurship. So, and these are all reasons why I ended up where I am. And some of it is honestly just good fortune and luck. But, you know, I also put in a lot of effort, but, you know, I have to admit that there is some luck in this. So I was sitting in Velcor having a very good job. And then I heard of this really cool language coming out called Java, which was, you know, half compiled and half interpreted. And it, could be used to write very cool, you know, uh, client experience without having a thick client and so on and so forth. So for, for some reason that captivated me. Everybody in those years, 95, 96, heard about Java, but some aspect of me made me go and learn it, take a course, learn it. And I wasn't looking for this, but before I knew it, I updated my resume and I got lots of contracting offers which is what ended up in GE, getting a very high hourly rate. I was not looking to leave Belcourt for that. But because I was inquisitive and self-driven to learn about a new language and create the skills, I was one of the first programmers who knew how to write code in WebLogic thing. Uh, this is the T3 server. It's a three-tier you know, server for J2E applications. And because I knew it, I was getting a lot of offers. Now, that's, that's how I became the lead architect at GE at a very young age, uh, building Source Online, which was one of the industry's first e-commerce platforms. Luckily, I was with a manager who was very entrepreneurial and had five colleagues who were very entrepreneurial, rather four, I was the fifth. So six of us one night decided that what we were building for GE was a template of things that every big enterprise was going to want to build. And there were no tools to build complex B2B e-commerce systems. So six of us literally left one night and started a company, which is called EC Cubed, which was powering the third wave of e-commerce. So it is EC to the power three. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I became the, the, the chief technology officer of that overnight, but I was also the janitor. I was also the coder. I was also the you know, bring lunch boy. I was also the guy pitching to VCs. I was also everything, right? And that's how I got into leadership because before we knew it, there were six of us and we grew the company to 300. And of course, I was the CTO, so I was running engineering. So it was a smaller team, 30, 40, 50 people. The rest of them were in sales and professional services and marketing and all those other things. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to be a leader by just being thrown into it. And I guess one of the things which worked for me, which you all can reflect on, which might be a takeaway for you is, I always play to my strength. Mm -hmm. I can I can bring you back examples much later, a few years later at, at Virtusa, where you always had to be genuine, right? Everybody's path is going to be different. There's no template I can give you, but you have to know what your strength is played to it. So my strength was always being with the troops, at night, coding through the night till 3 a.m., till 4 a.m., you know, not commanding them, but being with them and leading them. And that is what I think really paid off in the early days. Now I'm saying early days is my 20s, right? I was in my late 20s when I was doing all this. Obviously, trying to pitch the product to VCs, to customers, to partners was a huge, huge, huge learning. And I think my career got accelerated by... In the four years I was doing ECQ, I probably gained experience of you know fifteen years in that time. So that's um, very interesting. Uh, I mean, the pattern continues that you just see the opportunity, you leave GE and you jump on it, right? Uh, how to figure it out later? We'll figure it out, kind of attitude. Um, and and you said it right. Uh, everybody has a different path there, and that's why we would want to talk to multiple CXOs or, uh, you know, in this series uh, and just learn from them because uh, all of us come from a different background and then we can maybe pick a couple nuggets from here and a couple nuggets from there and then accelerate our own career that way. Um, 
So, uh, I mean, this is great. Uh, so let's move on to the next question, um, which is, um, you know, since you have grown teams and everything, um, you know, what kind of qualities are you looking for uh, in people when you're assembling a team? What do you look for? Yeah, that's, that's a very good, uh, good question. So, I mean, there are people I'm looking for when I'm interviewing them, but there's people that I'm pushing up their, uh, the career ranks once I work with them. And um, very often I'm just looking for ability to get shit done. I mean, that is the bottom line because there are a lot of people you'll find in the workplace who are very good at explaining why something didn't happen. Yeah. And it's useful. It's useful to have people with that insight because somebody needs to have the insight because otherwise you can't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But it's better to be somebody who can take analysis of why something didn't happen to turn it around to, to a set of actions that they can own and drive to make sure it happens and that's what uh, i've always prided myself on and that's what i look for in my teams uh, i don't let them make excuses um i i hate excuses so i always tell whether it's my son in a sport that he plays that I can give examples of, which is very difficult, but I don't let him make excuses because once you start making excuses, uh, then it's very convenient, right? It's not me. It was the weather. It was the other guy. You know, I'm not lucky. Or in a work situation, he might say, I didn't get the requirement on time or he didn't give me the design on time mm -hmm. or the environment was down. So always um, keeping the monkey on the person's back. So the second most published HBR article from Howard Business Reviews got is called "Who's Got the Monkey." I would uh, I would uh, encourage all of you to download. It's freely available on the internet. Who's got the monkey? It's a the abstract which is easy to read. You can also read the full one. And I got that from uh, my my boss at WD. He said, "Don't give your monkey to me." <laughs> I <was> like what? <laughs> monkey management is very important. So if you are in leadership, people will try to pass off the monkey from their back to you, yeah. and you have to be very very good at keeping the monkey where it belongs. Right, right. Uh, but that's easier said than done because you need to be able to say, "Is this problem really to be owned by this person who's struggling with it? If it is, then you have to support them." to be successful with it. And if it really has to go somewhere else, then you help move it to somebody else who then owns it. But you need to have clear articulation of the structure of the team, the roles and responsibilities, and the right people in the roles in the structure. And I think this is uh, very important quality. Sorry, uh, please continue. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so, so, so that, I was just saying that. So I think that's an important thing. So the things I look for in, in leaders uh, is really ability to get shit done ability to manage the monkeys on the back and get stuff done self-driven nature right i want them to be self-driven like i had to have the energy to go and fight and push and get stuff done uh, not make excuses not just point fingers not passively resist things not seek personal credit uh, the leaders i like are people who are willing to take the blame when things go wrong, but are willing to give all the credit to the team when things go right. Uh, things of that nature. Okay, excellent. Um, I, I want to kind of reflect a little bit on what you just said. Um, you know, I heard a lot from non-Indians about Indians that, you know, Indians have this chalta hai attitude. Okay, yeah, I got 80% of the work done anyway. What's the big deal? Ho jayega. Uh, but uh, you know, from American point of view, at least my exec coach keeps telling me, no, 100% is 100%. Uh, you know, otherwise you might as well have not done anything. You know, if you had problems, you should have, uh, you know, talked to your boss before, figure out alternate, you know, reset your expectations, whatever it is. So I think, um, you know, what you're looking, uh, the skill that you're looking for is extremely important uh, in, in America, at least. Uh, so I think you. it's important anywhere, I would say, and I would not necessarily say 
that that chalta hai attitude is only with indians or whatever i think things have changed i think i've seen the chalta hai attitude with non indians as well and i've seen very driven people and indians as well and clearly you can see from you know sundar pichai to satya nandela to the whole roster of characters at the top obviously you know that that trait is there in many many uh with our background as well so absolutely and, yeah. and that's why we have successful people like you but i i just wanted to make a broader statement that people you know uh, there are many of us who think that way and that is not okay uh, that no, is that is not that's not okay and especially if you want to grow and if you want to stand out uh you know uh, you, you can't be okay with that see i mean if you explicitly there's nothing wrong with that right i have friends who want a certain kind of a uh, lifestyle which is very low stress and very less work and they want to really focus on other things and i really think there's nothing wrong with that so uh, it's not okay when you're trying to become a leader yeah no i mean exactly so it depends on what you want out of it right what do you want out of your career what do you want out of your life right. based on that you have to make a choice but if you want to lead and you want to uh grow into higher cx or responsibility then you have to get stuff done not alone but to the team and that needs self drive that needs organization that needs pushing that needs not accepting the the status quo not accepting the chalta hai right so well, thank you um so next question uh, what do you find rewarding as a cx so uh again impact i had the ability to create an impact right i mean um in my previous company in vertusa i was near the top uh but i was an evp and you know beyond the evp right you had president and ceo and cfo and all that and there a lot of times i felt that the way a problem was being solved was not how i would do it and uh, beyond a certain point even at that level as an evp svp whatever we would do workshops we'd brainstorm and eventually some of the ideas would just not go my way which is fine i would always align to what the final decision was that you have to do whether it's your idea or not the final idea you have to fully back it and i did that but i always had that in my mind saying i wonder if my instincts are right or are they wrong so i was very happy when i got a chance to be the number 2 guy at product to begin with uh, seven and a half years ago and then i was really able to push through a lot of my ideas with conviction and i must say my batting average wasn't bad uh, not that i didn't make mistakes but it was at least 75% 80% right which is to me a very good average and then of course you have decisions you make wrong which you then reflect upon and you improve going forward so one of the rewarding things of being a cfo is you're near the top and again 3 4 months back 5 months back i became the top guy right uh, the the founder and mm -hmm. chairman so enough a uh, faith in me to give me the ceo job that he had held for 23 years which was very humbling and uh, very rewarding for me just to have him do that uh, but it's the ability to make the call and 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 see it through that is very rewarding um to build a team to build a, a culture the way you think it should be to build product or service differentiation differentiation the way you think it should be um to really help others with their careers right to guide to coach them to shape them create the next generation of leaders uh, to create success for clients i'm still very 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 client focused and client oriented and that's what gives me the most uh, kind of satisfaction so going back to what you just said um, that i'm following up with a question so what are the two or three suggestions for iitians uh, that you would Uh, give uh, to get to your level um i i think you do have to you know play to your strengths i mean definitely show a lot of uh, self drive uh, to take on more stretch so if you're given a job just doing the job is not enough you have to be able to look to the side and see what are the broader initiatives and problems beyond your area and can you connect the dots and actually make an impact can you actually help your boss you know hit his goals or her goals can you actually help your boss's boss hit his or her goals uh that is what i would encourage you to do because that will show that you're not in a box you can actually think broader 
but more importantly, not just think broader, but be able to make some connections and collaborate and make things happen at a broader level. Once you do that, you'll automatically get picked because if you're in a growing company, there's always more problems than you have people to solve them. And if anybody's showing the, the talent and the initiative and the capability to do that, they will definitely get uh, you know rewarded with growth. So uh, I want to double click a little bit on what you just said. Uh, a lot of people you know, are afraid to talk to their boss or they don't even want, like, you know, they do their weeklies or whatever, but uh, beyond whatever they're assigned, they're af afraid to talk. So how, how does this uh, negotiation happen? How does this conversation happen with your boss and more importantly, your boss's boss? Because a lot of people have this block in mind. Oh, I cannot talk to my boss's boss because my boss will think something weird. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, I was never in this mode of going out of my way to talk to my boss's boss. I mean, uh, definitely my boss. I would always talk to them and understand what was worrying them and what are the big issues. And, and not just my boss, even my peers and trying to help them mm -hmm. with their issues and things of that nature, right? Uh, boss's boss, hopefully your company has some sort of interaction with skip levels. So you you leverage that or the group sessions where you're supposed to present ideas, be prepared. Uh, always one of the founders of the company I worked for, Vatusa, John Gillis, very, very bright man. I learned to have to say, always have this you know, elevator pitch in your mind, right? So if you're walking down the hall and your boss's boss says, you're in the elevator with them and say, what's up? Don't just talk about the weather and blah, 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 right? Of course, you know, be social, sociable and say one or two of those things. But then say, hey, by the way, did you know that we worked on this thing and the performance, it's early days, but it's actually 10 times what we benchmarked last month. You know, drop it in. Again, you're not seeking personal credit. You're seeking credit for the team that you're a part of. So I would, I would definitely, uh, you know, use every opportunity to, to kind of get that out. Uh, I think very important. Important. You do a good job. It's very important to share that you are doing a good job. Again, don't do it in a personal way. I think what I hate and most people will not like is somebody who just keeps saying, I did this, I did this, I did this. As, as long as you have a lot of we in it and it's about the team and what the team accomplished and you are a part of the team, I think that's that's the way to do it. And okay. doing it in a, in a way which is all about sharing the information about a best practice with the organization so that everybody is aware of it and benefits from it. Not from the view of saying, look at me, I'm so good, right? There's a difference. So what you're saying is, uh, it's not just important to do things. Uh, it's also important to market yourself, your team uh, of the accomplishments they have done. So uh, not only uh, people are aware of it, but next time something happens, uh, they can probably come to you uh, because they know you can do it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's all very contextually uh, specific, right? So I'll do a um, maybe one minute product overview because somebody also asked, are you a product company or a service company? Sure, sure. But the reason I'm doing that is because I'll, I'll tie it into this point that you just made. So I'll come to that after a minute. So we are a leading uh, player in the connectedness domain. So connectedness is essentially anything that enables a connected life for a consumer or a connected business. So obviously at the very bare bones is connectivity. So a lot of our customers are telecom companies like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, et cetera. And then there's all the app companies which are building experience on, on top of it. It could be like, you know, Uber, Facebook, Meta, et cetera. These are customers. And then there's the infra players. So you would think of GCP, AWS, Cisco, et cetera, being all the you know, uh, the the big infra player. So all of these are our customers. And we are a services company. We do very complex implementations and manage services and transformation for all these companies. So as we do these programs and projects, I'm always asking the teams, what did we learn from it, which can be useful to somebody else who is undergoing or will be undergoing a similar journey? So if you go to product.com and click on insights, we are extremely proud of the hundreds of insights that have been written by productians over the years. 
So every one of them, if you read, that's a synopsis as good as any industry journal. And it'll tell you what was the business problem, what were the challenges, what was the approach to kind of solve it, what were the pros and cons of multiple approaches, why did we pick one, what were, you know, the benefits, etc. Very, very nicely written with infographics and everything. Coming back to your point, why did I bring up this whole point? When you do something good, it's not just about the fact that we had this great performance tuning that we did. Write down a small paper, one or two pages on what made it happen. Mm. And how can another team do the same thing if they mm. face a similar challenge? That's what I would call an insight. Uh, obviously, for us as a consulting company, insights are key to our differentiation and how we sell and how we deliver. But there's no reason that you can't be insightful in how you do your work. And when I say you, I mean you, your teams, your product teams, et cetera. Uh, with that, um, uh, there are a lot of questions, but we don't have much time. So I do want to give some time for others to ask questions. Uh, but first, um, Jitender, do you have any uh, question you would like to ask? Uh, and for others, I would say, please uh, raise your hands uh, in, in this reaction and uh, we can, we'll go over. Uh, uh, then you can ask your question directly to Harsha. So, Jitu. Yeah. yeah, Harsha, first of all, thanks. Very, very insightful. I noted some of the things I could capture here in the chat. And I also uh, put my question here, but let me ask you. Uh, so as you rightly said, we the key ingredients are ownership, leadership, persistence, relationships, very important for being a CEO. But as a CEO, you are no more limited to just one function, but all the functions within a company. So what is your view on planning your CXO journey or CEO journey? And while planning that, getting exposure to multiple functions within a company, right? It could be sales, marketing, finance, procurement, X, Y, Z. Uh, just just would like to know how do you go about it? Yeah, so, you know, we are a technology services company, so it, it really helps that uh, I'm a technical guy. I started my career as a coder, as a tech lead, as an architect. Uh, you know, I would always want the head of a hospital, the administrator to have been a doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that kind of really helps. I think it'd be very difficult for a CFO who's never written a piece of code to run product. It just be very, very difficult. That's why Sundar Pichai runs Google and, and so on and so forth. I really am from that bent of mind. So I would definitely be more for, you know, Bill Gates than uh, Balmer, Steve Balmer, for example. Right? Uh, that's just my philosophy. But uh, so, so I grew up, so obviously for me, delivery was natural. As a founder of a company, selling was also natural, you know, selling technology. So sales and delivery were just kind of natural. What I had to learn over time uh, was, and of course, people was also a bit natural in terms of how to motivate teams and all. Obviously, as I went up in my career, I learned more formal methods of performance management and, you know, all of that stuff. But that was still a bit natural. Things like finance, I, I would recommend, uh, let me see if I can get this book. Yeah, th this book I would I would get if, if all of you are not uh, finance uh -huh. professionals like me. It's called How Finance Works. In this I, it's by Mihir Desai from Harvard. Brilliant book. I read it page to page a couple of times, end to end. It really helped me with my understanding of finance a few years back. Um, but, you know, things, other things, you know, you need to be able to be comfortable not being the best person in every subject. So I don't need to be as good as the CFO because the CFO obviously is a chartered accountant and all of that. I need to know enough about it so I can ask him intelligent questions. I can understand what he shares with me and I can trust him when he recommends decisions to me. And I can make the same kind of case about every function. So you should always play to your strengths. Be better than anybody at the areas you're strongest at. And then have the ability to discern what other experts are telling you and question them, but let them make the call and, and you know, support them and so on and so forth. 
I will buy it. Exercise the first is Mohinder, go ahead. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arsha, for doing this. Really appreciate your comments. So my question was about uh, running a company predictably. So broader question is like, how do you set growth goals? You know, so uh, how do you determine, you know, how fast you're going to want to grow or going to grow and then break it down into, if you've set some promises with the board, you know, how do you make sure that you are predictable in delivery, right? Uh, it, it will delivery of your business. Yeah, that's a good question. See, some of them are just top-down goals which have nothing to do with, uh, you know, what we think. So that's the bottom-up and there's the current situation and there's just the top-down, right? So there's a certain rate of return that our investors just seek from us, need from us. And that is based on the industry. So we are in IT services, technology services. So there's a certain rate of uh, appreciation of the value of the stock which is just expected and typically in our industry the growth rates expected are quite high i mean you're expected to grow like 25 percent a year uh, in a in a good year if if it's not a very good year expected to grow 20 percent or average year at least 15 and so on and so forth obviously it changes with the size of the company so part of it mohinder is just to be in line with what the industry expects. Obviously, when the industry itself gets a bit slow, like this year is a bit slow, everybody gets a bit slow. So that helps you to manage the board and things of that nature. But then when you go from the top down, you have to then do the bottom up planning to hit that. So if you have various accounts, you look at you know how much each account can give. So for that, you have to do a lot of intelligence. The key to planning is intelligence, understanding the spend patterns of each client's building relationships, making sure that your portfolio of services or products has been socialized with all the relevant buyers. So you have to know where the money is. You talk about following the money. So there's a whole account development structured process. Beyond that, then you have to say, what do I need to, to get new logos? Do I do them directly or do I do it with my partners, You know, Google, Amazon, Salesforce, ServiceNow, whoever, and you need staff to do all of that. Then you say, what strategic bets am I going to make? Am I going to make a new practice this year? I'm going to get into uh, something else that we have not been in. A new geography. We just recently opened Kenya. We opened an office in Kenya. Two years back, we opened Panama. We have 250 people there now. Uh, so overall, we have 6,000 people, right? In 30 countries, but main offices are maybe five, seven, eight uh, countries. So that's the strategic planning aspect of it. So that's how you typically do it in terms of um, the key though is again, you know, expectation management, whether it's a client where you're doing a complex program where delivery is going to be delayed or the board where numbers are not exactly going to be uh, what you thought and they thought. You have to be able to share the information in a way which uh, doesn't get you fired. <laughs> so you have to be able to share the information, but with enough depth and, you know, uh, Trust caution that uh, they they believe you and are willing to still back you with what you want to do. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I agree that first condition to do your job is that you don't get fired. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, thanks, Mohinder. Uh, next is Anil Pundir. Thank you. Uh, lovely session so far. So appreciate the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Quick question. So I'm a data science leader background. But I so I come from software engineering background to data science leadership, but I see that a lot of C people now have some exposure to product leadership. Now, do you see the same trend on West Coast? Because I live in Detroit, um, you know, East Coast side. Uh, but yeah. just wanted to see your opinion there. I don't quite understand the question. Can you be a little bit more specific? Yeah. So, do you see more leaders uh, with the product uh, leadership background or product background or do you see the same trend of engineering and uh, business people becoming C leaders? Oh, oh yeah, product absolutely. I mean, product uh, definitely. I mean, in a product company, I would say product management can definitely become a C level leader because product is the product, uh, right? So absolutely. So uh, what I meant is, it's much harder for a CFO or a HR leader or people like that 
um, or an internal CIO who manages internal applications to become a CEO, as opposed to somebody who comes from the core business, which includes sales, which includes uh, actual technology, which includes product management. Uh, all of those, I think, have a, I think, in my mind, uh, easier path to the top because you're from the core business, right? Thank you. So next is Neha. Thank you for this wonderful session, Harsha and Rishi and Jitu. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with overwhelm? Considering you have multiple deadlines and you know number of teams working and several different product lines, what are, is your personal take? So before we go that, I would like at least the people who are asking questions to show their face. And, and just repeat this question one more time, um, if you can say. Uh, how do you deal with overwhelm? What practices do you do on a daily basis? Or you have okay. multiple deadlines to meet and several product lines and different teams to manage. So Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I spend a lot of time on my fitness um, and that really, really helps me. The It's funny, the more I exercise, the more energy I have. So I run about five times a week um, and, you know, play tennis or some other sports, etc. So that really gives me a lot of energy and, and uh, focus. Um, other than that, I'm very, very, very good at organization. So I, I don't let anybody control my calendar. I'm always uh, trying to see uh, if uh, I'm required in a meeting. Uh, if uh, something being given to me as a task is something I should handle, and if I if I should, then I I do handle it. Uh, but if it is not, then I make sure it goes back to where it should get handled. I'm always driving my agenda of my calendar. I'm always booking out several weeks in advance if something is coming up. I'm always. I mean, small example. I sent a mail to Hrishikesh last week saying, "How many attendees do you expect?" You know. What questions do you expect, right? So it's just a small example, but I'm always trying to be in charge of the agenda so that I can drive it and so on. So that really gives me a lot more control of uh, my life. Thank you, Harsha. Uh, we are very fortunate to be on your calendar, indeed. So who's next? Uh, is that Animesh? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Harsha. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'll get right into my question. I um, I know when sometimes we have leadership positions, although not the top, we have someone else to guide and counsel us on some of the most difficult things. And the example I have is you have to sometimes choose between doing the ideal. Maybe it's something related to, you know, how much testing you want to do for a product or how soon do you want to launch versus some, you know, the optimal. And uh, I guess something that I struggle with is having someone else who is over or, you know, more responsible than me in the company can, uh, can be the one to take this decision. How do you deal with being the top person in the company who has to kind of when the buck stops with you when, when it comes to decisions like these? I mean, I actually uh, enjoy making the decisions which uh, I feel only I can make uh, because, um, I mean, I, I always have a bias towards action and I believe that making a timely uh, action decision is better than, you know, stalling and procrastinating and so on, even if 20% of the time you're wrong. Because I really, what really annoys me is bureaucracy and everybody just slowing down and stopping and nothing happens. It just annoys me. It just feels like so much lost productivity. At least if you make a decision and make a mistake, you can always undo it and and redo something else. So uh, the decisions that I'm supposed to make, I actually enjoy making it. Uh, there's no, no issue with that. Uh, you asked another question as to, in your case, you are hoping somebody else can make the decision. I think you should always have a point of view. 
even if you're saying how much testing I can have, is it optimal or is it not, etc. Uh, I think it's good to always see the other party's point of view. Uh, because you might say, I need to do 100% testing. The other person is saying, we don't have time. 70 is good enough. Try to understand why they're saying 70 is good enough. What are the pressures on them? If we didn't release it, what would happen? And I think that often helps to balance out one's point of view. I found so much friction among team members, which if you reverse their roles, they will actually take the other person's uh, point of view given enough time. I've seen that many times. A simple example is an on-site project manager and an offshore tech lead. Offshore tech lead will think that the on-site project manager is completely unreasonable. The on-site project manager will think the offshore tech lead is completely clueless. As an interesting experiment, you move them, swap them for two weeks, I'll guarantee you they'll both come to the point of view the other person had. Because the world they are in and the pressure they are dealing with and the constraints they're working with are the same. It's just the people are in different chairs. Thank you. So, thank, you. thank you. I want to be mindful of time. We are one minute over. Um, Harsha, if you have a few more minutes, there is one. I, I, I'm, I'm open. You guys can stay as long as you want. I have no constraint. So it's okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So next is Abhishek. Hi, Harsha. Thanks a lot for many insightful thoughts. Uh, while I agree with you on a tech guy to actually take that leadership and so that he can actually empathize with what exactly the core business is, what could be the challenges. I personally face one issue that uh, if you are a techie at an early stage to mid stage, you end up going back to the project, start thinking like, okay, let me do this and contribute over there. So I would love your, to hear your thoughts, like how do you keep your focus on to the long-term vision as well as like a lot of many day-to-day -day activities? How do you take care of that one? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, see, it all depends on the role, right? If my role is uh, uh, to be a programmer, I am going to very much focus on what is on my plate in this print and make sure I get done. But even in that, the, the traits which help us defining what done means. So even when I was a programmer, I took great pride in it having zero defects and having all the unit tests done and all it being documented and you know uh, tested eight different ways and released ahead of schedule and so on and so forth. And when mm -hmm. that happens, then it gives you time to think of the next print and start seeing what design changes I want to make and things of that nature. So you yeah, extrapolate that to the CEO, right? So when I dig into a pursuit, you're trying to win a deal with this telecom or this tech company or whatever, I just go deep enough to make sure that I feel comfortable with what the team is doing. And sometimes, you know, the team is a trusted team that I've worked with forever. I don't introspect. I don't get into the kitchen as much. If somebody is newish, I tend to do more. If they have my trust, I leave them a little bit. But once I feel comfortable, then I don't have the need to just stay there and be part of everything. I just leave it and go to the next one. Then I look at who's struggling and which area. And often that gets me thinking more forward. Not now, but next week or two weeks or a month, if not next quarter, next year, things of that nature. So um, I think this, what you're describing is, listen, that's a skill you have to build if you have to go beyond being an individual contributor. You have to be able to look further out and broader. But I give a lot of uh, emphasis in my interviews to people. Uh, and one of the values, winning values of product, product has four winning values. One of them is depth. One of them is persistence. One of them is speed. One of them is futuristic. So everybody in product in the leadership is pretty deep. So anybody who's not deep who joins the company, they last about nine months to a year and then they're gone. So whether you're a finance person, whether you're a technical person, whether you're a sales person, you really need to be able to go down four levels and explain things and, you know, make your own spreadsheets and make your own documents and all of that. So, so don't underestimate the value of what you're saying, the techie person wanting to go into details. That's actually something we like, as long as you can also zoom out and do other things. Yeah, okay. got it. Thank you.
There was a question by Venkat uh, on the chat. Uh, Venkat, uh, do you want to ask or? Yeah, sure. Uh, certainly, I asked. Um, Harsha, there's great insights um, on how you mold your career and then you know continue to push yourself to where you are. And um, and I'm sure it is not the last one. You you might be doing a lot more than this. Um, what is that you have done outside of the work that prepare you every step of the way? Because as a CEO or as in any role you took, you have to prepare yourself for those roles. So what is that you did outside the work um, that continuously challenge yourself and you know meet the uh, the current uh, position or the beyond? I think I always kind of stay in touch with clients. I think that is probably uh, really, really important. Uh, for most of the time I've been in the US, right, since I graduated. Mm -hmm. um, but for three years, I took uh, a role in Hyderabad to set up Indian operations for this company, which was founded by Sri Lankans, which is what you said. Mm -hmm. So I started the operations in Hyderabad. But even there, sitting in Hyderabad, I made it a point to stay in touch with customers post them when they came, but also travel back to the U.S. frequently and, you know, always talk to them and get a sense for CSAT client satisfaction and what mm -hmm. are their plans and what are the trends they're seeing. So I think that's really important because uh, the, the technology landscape moves so fast that if you don't know what is happening, uh, it is it is very, very hard to uh, kind of, you know, achieve the success that uh, I've been able to do. So I would say that's that's uh, that's one key thing staying uh, the partners also right it's not just clients for example you know we have teams who you know work with again all the big tech companies knowing what the new frameworks are coming out what is changing you know mm -hmm. what will quantum computing do what is gen ai doing mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things are really important it's great good to know thank you okay so i see one more question from uday singh uh, about mentors uh, are you here today Uh, so I had a question on mentorship, uh, which I skipped. So I'll just uh, take Uday's question. Um, how to go find mentors and who who can guide us break into CXO roles? One one answer is you know come back to such episodes again and again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean. Uh, Look, I mean, mentors, uh, mentors, mentoring is such a uh, unique relationship, special relationship, and it only works when it's two way, right? The mentor should want to mentor somebody, and the mentee should be very open to it. Uh, so, if you find somebody in the workplace or somebody you look up to, uh, definitely, you know, ask them, and that's one great way to do it. There are also professional coaches which that I have benefited from. Uh, who are ex-colleagues, one of them I work with and many of our team members work with, he's very good because the process of mentoring is also one of self-exploration. It is not, a good mentor is not going to come and tell you do this. They're going to help you figure out what you want to do and how you can expand your horizons and capabilities to do what you want to do. So I would say that and beyond that, you know, seek out trainings and things like that where you can go and um, uh, understand, you know, a broader picture and things of that nature. But finding a mentor is an important thing. It could be somebody you pay as a coach to do, or it could be somebody in the workplace that uh, you seek out and they are willing to make time for you. Even if they just spend, you know, half an hour with you every two weeks, that could be very, very helpful. Or even half an hour every month. That's awesome. Um, now, I don't see any more questions in the chat but maybe i missed something so last call anybody wants to ask question uh, i have appreciate a couple of hands were up i see shashwat's hand up for oh, a long time yeah i think shashwat had a question before and he didn't put the hand down okay got it and then my I, question, shashwat, I had, you have a different I had a question. yeah my question was uh okay i'll open my uh okay so, hi, Arsha. Thanks for the talk. My question is, uh, what are some things one can do to convince leadership to put one on an accelerated, to, conver uh, to convince the leadership team to put one on an accelerated part to leadership? And can you give some examples of what you might have done or 
your colleagues might have done to achieve the same it might be as simple as a communication example or some value system example yeah i mean i can tell you how we are spotting people for uh, accelerated leadership at product so we didn't want to do yet another process where you know people would have to again nominate people and again you then argue about how many people and all that so we made it very simple uh, we said first of all we have five point uh, rating scale uh, from one to five where one is exceptional two is exceeds you know three is meets expectation and so on and so forth so we said a necessary criteria is that they have to have had one or two ratings. So they're at least exceeding expectations on what is expected of them in the job role. And then beyond that, but that's not sufficient. Beyond that, they accumulate points in a very automated algorithm which runs a product, which looks at what else you're contributing to. Mm -hmm. So you could have done a bunch of interviews which helps the recruitment team. You could have written these insights papers which I mentioned. You could have participated in a hackathon. You could have participated in a run, which a fitness run. We could have done some social thing. We just donated some 200 uh, computers in Chennai. So there are guys who went and went to the local school and gave, you know. So all those accumulate points. And that's how we run this algorithm and then come out with. Why do we do that is because we want people who are not only good at doing their job. They are behaving based on a self-drive to do more. And that's what we're really looking for because everything I've said today, whether it's about persistence or being entrepreneurial or ability to get shit done or you know doing more, looking forward, all needs that self-drive. So uh, that's how we are looking for you know leaders to accelerate. If you demonstrate those kind of behaviors, that's when you're going to get uh, picked. And honestly, some companies, uh, they'll never, if, they, if you feel like they're never going to pick you, then it's time to move on and find a different place where, you know, uh, there is that opportunity. Because it's also a function of being in the right company. If the company itself is stagnant, you know, you can try all you will, but it may not really kind of work. Thank you. All right. Thanks. And this, sorry, I just had a follow-up question. Were there uh, times where... Let's finish. Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. And okay. uh, maybe Mayuresh's question. Hey, hi. Um... Hi. Um, sorry, uh, I my camera is not working. Uh, but yeah, uh, <clears throat> one question I had is uh, basically, uh, uh, how do you mix in all your fitness regimen at the work, uh, and how do you structure your day? Uh, because you said you're running five days a week, it's, it's which is not easy. So I would like to know that. Like yeah, like that's a more. that's a good question. Yeah, my days are pretty pretty busy for sure. Um. Uh, yeah, typically I'll get up by, you know, 5.45 or so. I, ideally, either if I if I run, it'll be like 6 a.m., 6 to 7 or so. Uh, if not, because sometimes calls start even earlier than that at 6, then it typically happens at lunchtime around 1 or something of that nature. Uh, my days, because I have a big India team and a European team, it's very packed in the morning. So anywhere from 6 or 7 till one or so there's almost no break uh, at all. And then uh, typically I'll get more time in the afternoon where I do more calls with US-based people or California-based people, et cetera, or customers, et cetera. Of course, customer comes first. I'll move everything for customers. And this is on a day when I'm not traveling. Uh, when I'm traveling, I make it a point to run where I go. That's how I explore cities. So I was in Puerto Rico last week, Tuesday, Wednesday, both days I ran and I get the team also running. So that's actually a good way to get them out also uh, when i'm at home uh, actually my son is a top level athlete himself uh, he does this very interesting sport called american ninja warrior in fact it was on tv today as well so he does obstacle training so many of my days in the evening go taking him to his training sessions and uh, watching him do these amazing things gives me a lot of energy also or sometimes with my daughter, who's more artistic, she's on the acting side. She acts and sings. So sometimes I have to take her to that. And, you know, those things keep me obviously also uh, energized. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's really it. Um, um, yeah, I mean, that's... So they are busy. I mean, I'm not going to lie. So sometimes at the end of the day, I'm pretty tired. But uh, 
if you start off and add an exercise to your day, I think you you do have more energy. It's a funny thing. So, thank you. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, across your career trajectory, since you're the expert and you've moved between companies, did you have to deal with any IP issues or legal issues? You know, and how do you go about that? I mean, only once when I was leaving my previous company, Vatusa, they they got very uh, worried that I could basically take away a lot of my team, which I'd built, oh. that they would all follow me out, etc. So they wrote a very big document. They made me sign saying I won't do ABC. But I really didn't have any intention of doing that anyway. In fact, for a couple of years after I left, I didn't even hire one person from that company because we just built it. There's enough talent outside, right? And after that time, many people have joined from my previous company, which was at least two, three years after I joined. Uh, but other than that, uh, I haven't had that issue, right? Um, luckily. But yeah, it can happen if you, obviously, if you go from a direct competitor, right? It's, things are sensitive. But in the US, honestly, if you don't do anything foolish, like you can't go to a competing company and try to take away an account the next day. That's just silly, right? So you have to lay low for six months or and you don't immediately go and try to hire from your team. As long as you're respectful, I think everybody knows that you have to make a living. Nobody is going to be super upset if you, you know, give it a six months or a year. Thank you. Um, back to you, Shashwat. Yeah. Follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, my follow-up question was, uh, were there moments during your career where you faced self-doubt? And if yes, what tool kits did you use to up yourself at that time and see the grand scheme of things? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've definitely had enough of that. Um, so, EC Cube, even though we had a fantastic run for four years, uh, then the dot-com bust happened in 2000, March. And then uh, the whole market tanked. NASDAQ went from 5,000 to 1,500 one day. We were a very hot startup, and unfortunately, by the end of the year, all the our half our customers went bankrupt and so on. So unfortunately, we had to shut down the company in December. Uh, the entire company that you know me and five others had founded. So it was very humbling. Came down crashing down to <laughs> ground zero. Uh, probably got a few weeks of unemployment checks also uh, for a, for a month or so, whatever. Uh, uh, but then after that, you know, so that those are tough times. I mean, those are more emotionally taxing than anything, right? It was not that the financial burden got too hard, but it was just going from where you were CTO, hot startup to like nothing. Uh, there is definitely self-doubt. So at that point, what do you do? I mean, look, we are all humans. We are born to survive, right? We'll figure out a way to survive. So uh, when I joined Virtus, I didn't think, you know, I would spend 15 years there. I just joined saying, okay, <laughs> here's a job. Let me do something. They're offering me a job to go to Hyderabad for three years to set up Indian operations. So let me do that. But one thing just led to the other. And I guess I did well. And so they kept giving me more responsibilities. They said, come back to US, do anything you want to do. Then I started hunting new logos. I got into Aetna and Thomson Reuters and so it became the healthcare practice and the media practice and so on and so forth. I just kept, I just kept doing different things. And before you knew it, you know, we went public and it was 15 years and so on. But the self-doubt does come. It will come for sure. And uh, uh, you just have to believe in yourself. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, and, and keep working at it, right? I'm a big believer in work ethics, right? So if you keep working really hard and, and refuse to give up, right? I think you'll always come out of it. Excellent. So, uh, any more questions? Last call. Okay. Uh, so, thank you so much, Harsha. Those are amazing insights. Um, really, uh, uh, it will help uh, a lot of us here to uh, follow what you said. And, and hopefully uh, I would love to see uh, people in this room uh, get to the CXO uh, level one day and, and, and be on the stage like you. Um, so thank you so much for your insights thank you. and thank you also for uh, you know staying uh, longer than our original plan to answer everybody's question.
Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. And thanks to Jitu for putting us together. And all the great questions I thought was very interactive. I'll leave you with one book recommendation because uh, you had asked me before and uh, somebody also asked on the chat. It's a book called A Confident Mind or The Confident Mind, I forget. It's by Dr. Nate uh, Zinser, I think. Zinser. Uh, he is a sports psychologist and an army psychologist who used to teach at West Point, uh, the army college. But uh, he's one of the guys who worked with Eli Manning, the New York Giants quarterback, uh, during the time that Eli won two Super Bowls against New England Patriots and Tom Brady. It's a fascinating book. It talks about how you can build a confident mind and how that's key to success, whether you're a sportsman, so that's why I have my son listen to it, or uh, if you have somebody going to give a big speech, or you are trying to, you know, perform well, do a surgery, or climb the corporate ladder. Uh, so I would recommend that book uh, very highly. Very important for the very first point you made, you know, take the responsibility. For taking that responsibility, you have to feel confident and the book will help. <laughs> for sure. And, and then everything works out on your own uh, as long as you're persistent there. So... Thank you so much again, and uh, let's close this Good. session until we meet again uh, next month. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Arshad. Thank you, Arshad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. Thanks, Thank you. <clears throat>